Good to see all those little kids being taught about Jesus. I really appreciate Amy and Calvin and all their helpers. Well, Moses has been having some problems with unbelieving Israelites. <laughs> Every time they were hungry, you brought us out here to die of starvation. Every time they were thirsty, you brought us out here to die of thirst. They're up by the Red Sea. You brought us here, out here to be killed by the Egyptians, you know. Four different times that we have recorded in God's Word. In time number four, Moses told the Lord, I think they want to stone me. So it had gotten pretty serious, and then along came a battle with the Amalekites, and the Lord had Moses stand on top of a hill and hold the staff up in the air. And as long as, by the way, I hold my staff up too, Yeah. They're, they're good people. But anyway, as long as he was holding the staff up in the air, they were prevailing. And then when he would let his hands down, they would not prevail. And so they supported Moses' hands. And that was God's way of saying, you depend on the prayers of Moses. I have chosen Moses to be my leader, and you need to follow Moses. Well, God wasn't finished yet. There's another lesson to learn. 
Moses is about to go up on Mount Sinai and receive the Ten Commandments that he's going to give to the Israelites. And God says, I'm not finished establishing Moses. I want to drive this into their minds that they take seriously the leadership of the one that I have called to be their leader. And so take a look at Exodus chapter 19, starting with verse 9, and see what we're talking about here. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. What the people had said, the Lord had said, You'll be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if you obey my commandments and keep my covenant. And they said, Everything that the Lord has said we will do. So Moses says, well, Lord, they said everything the Lord has said we will do, you know. Now the Lord says, okay, well, that's what they think they're going to do. But look at the rest of it. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Consecration, it doesn't say what the details were in that, but that means to set yourself aside as holy to the Lord. It could mean that... He killed an animal sacrifice and sprinkled blood. Of course, he couldn't have done that on all, those, all of those people. But there were leaders over thousands and then over hundreds and over fifties and over tens that had been appointed at the uh, advice of his son-in-law, uh, father-in-law, Jethro. So probably just on the leadership, you know, or maybe he just prayed a prayer. It doesn't say. But what it does say was they washed their garments. It's like... You're, you're going to be in the presence of holy God when he descends upon the mountain and you need to be all washed up and set aside for God. This is going to be a special moment, okay? Let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. You shall set bounds for the people all around saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Huh. What kind of bounds? Well, of course, they didn't have the tape, you know, like police use and stuff like that. But maybe there were elders. Maybe there were the people in charge of the hundreds and the fifties standing around the mountain saying, This is as far as you go. Maybe there was some kind of a line drawn. It doesn't say. But they were warned, Don't touch the mountain. Don't touch the mountain or you die. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. In other words, if somebody does that, you don't touch him or you're going to die. Just stone him. Stone him or shoot him. Don't touch the mountain where the Lord is going to descend. Doesn't that sound a little bit extreme? I mean, who does he think he is? God or something? Ah, let's go on. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Now, of course, if you're familiar with like a French horn, the sound that a French horn makes when it goes up real high, that's kind of the way that a ram's horn would sound. And that was actually the trumpet that they would use to call people together. But this is God's special ram's horn sound that I believe probably nothing has been heard like it since. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, however he did that. And they washed their garments, and he said to the people, Be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. In other words, don't have relations. So it came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, ram's horn sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. You know, so I want you to understand, he's saying, Moses, I'm going to establish your leadership, and I'm also going to establish my holiness among these people. And when this ram's horn sounded, it was so loud that it made people shake. It scared them. You know, sometimes you need to be scared. You know, sometimes the best thing is for you to be scared. Sometimes that's the only thing that works. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. 
Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. You know, we're not talking about just a thunderstorm or some kind of a forest fire or something like that. We're talking about a ram's horn that is so loud that people are trembling at the sound of it. And we're talking about the mountain that he's descended upon shaking. You know, we're talking about something that you don't just see in nature. Once again, we have God speaking. And God not speaking through an individual person, but God speaking to and through an entire nation of people so that we get the, God, the, the gospel and get the word of God from multitudes of witnesses as opposed to one person that says, you got to take my word for it. These people were eyewitnesses to the majesty and the holiness and the awesomeness of God Almighty. And so when the word of God was given to Moses, and remember the first five books of the Bible were simply called Moses sometimes, when the word of God was given to Moses, there was no doubt with these people that God was speaking through Moses. In order to establish before those witnesses, this is the word of God, God needed to make his point. Quit rebelling against the leader that I have placed before you. I'm going to give the word of God to him to give to you to give to everybody else. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder... Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. <clears throat> the Lord came down on Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Time out. Nobody touched the mountain. You touch the mountain, you die. Except Moses. Get his point? Moses is my selected person. Moses is the person that I've called. Moses is the person that I've set aside. You touch the mountain, you die. Moses, you come on up. Now, later on, Moses and Aaron actually came on up, his brother Aaron, because when God established the priesthood and had the tabernacle built and all of the sacrifices established and stuff, Aaron was the high priest. Okay? And so... Aaron and Moses were allowed to come up. Anybody else, you die. Your dog gets free and touches the mountain, too bad for your dog. Holy, holy God. Go warn the people not to break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. In other words, not only is the, were the priests not supposed to touch the mountain, they were supposed to be especially careful that they were consecrated and set aside for God. The picture that you get is stay away, stay away, stay away. I'm holy. So, first of all, he confirmed his chosen leader, Moses. You stay away or you die. Moses, you come on up. And you got the loud trumpet and the rumblings and the thunder and the lightning and the smoke. You know, God saying... I am taking seriously my leader Moses, and you take him serious too. But he was also going to confirm the word that he said through that leader. Remember that first verse? They will know that I am speaking through you. That was the whole point of it. Now, you know, you think about it. You've got all kinds of ideas about what God is like. And people just come up, you know, they just make God in their own image. Well, I think God ought to be this way. Well, I think God ought to be that way. Well, I just can't believe in a God that would do this or a God that would do that. You know, God has to break through and say, I'm going to prove that it's me doing the talking. And so I'm not going to speak to one person. I'm going to speak to a whole nation of people. And then I'm going to do things that only God can do in the presence of that multitude of witnesses to confirm my word. And then I'm going to preserve my word. And that's exactly what he has done with the Bible. And nothing close to that has done, been done with anything else that claims to be Holy Scripture. Nothing even close to that. That's because God is big enough to speak to his creation and to prove that it's him doing the speaking and to preserve it. He confirmed his chosen leader. He confirmed his word through that leader. He confirmed his own holiness. And wouldn't you say he confirmed his dreadful power? Whoa, look what's happening to the mountain. 
Well, let's carry it now to the tabernacle. When we're talking about the holiness and the power and the purity of God Almighty. At the tabernacle, that was the place where the, the Israelites were supposed to worship God. But you couldn't even get into the courtroom area or the courtyard area until you went past the burnt offering altar. Which means that if you're going to go inside the courtyard area and worship God, the first thing that has to happen is your sin has to be dealt with. And so some kind of a blood offering would be made <clears throat> and placed upon that altar so that you could go inside and worship God. So the first thing that God is saying is, you deserve to die for your unholiness. I'm holy and you're not. And you can't approach me unless somebody dies in your place. Now, it says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats cannot really take away sin. So they were just foreshadowing of the one sacrifice that God would accept. And that was the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. But the way it was set up in that old covenant, you could not even approach to worship God unless you passed the burnt offering altar. And some kind of blood had to be offered up for you. Now you're in the courtyard and you can sing his praises and you can pray to him. But that's as far as you can go. There's a curtain in front of you that's called, that delineates the holy place. And only the priests can go into the holy place. And in front of them is the incense altar where they would offer up incense. And that was the smoke going up to heaven, symbolic of their prayers. On their left would be the menorah, which would have seven candles. And the priests were responsible for keeping the oil in that and keeping the wicks fixed and keeping those candles burning. And on the right was the table of showbread, unleavened bread, 12 loaves replaced every day. To signify how God was providing daily for the children of Israel. The light representing his presence and his leadership with them. The incense altar representing his accepting their prayers as they offer up to them. And then on the right, the bread showing that he was going to meet all of their daily needs. But you had to assume that that was in there. Because unless you were a priest, you couldn't go in there. Unless you were from the tribe of Levi, which was the priestly tribe, you couldn't go there. But then there's another curtain. And the priest couldn't even go in there. It represented the holy of holies. And inside the holy of holies was a box. A gold-covered box that had the commandments inside it. And some other things like a pot of manna and like Aaron's rod that budded. We'll get to that later. But... It represented the very presence of God Almighty. And the priests couldn't go in there. Only one person could go in there and he could only go one day out of the year. That was the Day of Atonement. And what he would do, first of all, he would offer up blood for himself. Because he understood, I have sinned against God. God is holy and God cannot be approached unless death occurs. The wages of sin is death and Someone has to die in my place. And so an animal would be sacrificed for that priest. And he would sprinkle blood upon himself. Then he was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood for the people of Israel on top of that box. The Ark of the Covenant. By the way, Indiana Jones didn't find it. Just thought I might mention that. Sprinkle blood on top of that. One time out of the year, they tied a rope to his ankle when he would go into the Holy of Holies. Because if he did it wrong, God would kill him. And you don't want a dead priest lying there in the Holy of Holies. And so they would tie a rope to his ankle just in case he didn't do it right. Now, why was God saying that? I think God is saying over and over, don't take my holiness lightly. I'm not the man upstairs. You don't thank your lucky stars. I'm not a she. I'm not God, whoever he or she is. I am, I am. I'm the great I am. Before me, there was nobody. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Besides me, there is no God, and I am holy. 
When Isaiah saw a vision of God Almighty in Isaiah chapter 6, it was his call to be a prophet. There were seraphim. Those are special angels that had six wings. In the presence of God Almighty, you have holy angels. And they're covering their faces. And they're covering their feet. Now, feet. How many of y'all have ever had a Mickey Mouse watch? Well, this is not a rabbit, okay. Here's Mickey Mouse. Have you ever seen Mickey Mouse when it's 6.30? He really looks funny when it's 6.30, okay? That's what we're talking about when they're covering their feet, okay? You get what I'm saying? Okay, with two wings... In the presence of holy God. These are angels. These are not people. In the presence of holy God. Okay. That takes care of four wings. Now the other two, they're flying. All right. That's what Isaiah saw. He didn't see God's face. God told Moses, no one sees my face and lives. But Isaiah saw the figure of God on his throne and he saw the seraphim covering themselves in the presence of holy God. And then what did Isaiah say? Oh, woe is me. I'm a dead man because I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And I've seen the king. And one of the angels said, don't be afraid. We'll purge your iniquity and then we'll send you to be a prophet. Okay. That's the kind of God that we're talking about. Psalm 119, 120, this biggest book of the Bible, Psalms 119. The psalmist, I believe it's another psalm of David, though it doesn't say David. It says, my flesh trembles for fear of God, and I'm afraid of your judgments. You know, one thing that I notice generation after generation, less and less reverence, respect for any authority, and reverence for God Almighty. You know, there are songs, and, and there are special songs. Jesus is my Savior. Yes, indeed. Jesus is my friend. No greater love does anyone have than to lay down his life. Friends, yeah, he wants us to be a friend of God. But Jesus is also Lord. He's Lord. King of kings and Lord of lords. When the apostle John, the night before Jesus was crucified, was having the, the Lord's Supper, they're all leaning on an elbow, and John is right next to Jesus, leaning on his elbow, you know, closest to him. And then when John saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, in his high, exalted state, he fell down like a dead man. Yeah. That's the holiness of God. Holy, unapproachable. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 16, he dwells in unapproachable light. Hmm. Okay, well, where are we going with this? It's changed. He hasn't changed. He is still holy. He is still awesome. He hates sin. The Bible says he is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, light and darkness don't have any fellowship with each other. But he loves people with an everlasting love. He is so holy, he cannot tolerate sin in his presence, but he loves us so much that he is willing to punish our sin on himself. That is amazing grace. God could just say, Human beings, <laughs> let's start over. Let's make another world. Just forget it. But it says, Jeremiah 31.3, I love you with an everlasting love. And when it says, describing the, the nature of God, the character of God, 1 John 4.8, God is love. His very character is love. And he loves us so much that the Bible says he took on flesh in the person of Jesus. He's Trinity, three persons, co-equal, not one less than the other. One of the persons of the Trinity said, I'll go on the mission. The other person said, I will be the one to empower him. And the other one said, I will be the one that he will obey like a man is supposed to obey God. So one serves as the Father, one serves as the Son, one serves as the Holy Spirit. All for the mission of getting you and me 
in the presence of this holy, holy, holy God. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, Christ died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Separated from God, did he not make that clear with the fire on the mountain and the shaking mountain and don't you come near or you'll die? Yeah, he made that clear. And now he says through Jesus Christ, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of everlasting life without cost. Guess what happened when Jesus was crucified? Darkness at noon for three hours. An earthquake, you think God might be saying something. Hmm. And then the temple where you have the holy place. Can't go in there unless you're a priest. You have the holy of holies, this thick four-inch curtain where only the high priest can go once a year and he just might die if he doesn't do it right. The Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, that curtain was torn from top to bottom and the holy of holies was opened up. Here's the Ark of the Covenant that represents the very presence of God. One time, a man by the name of Uzzah reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant when it was being moved, and God killed him. It was God's way of saying, don't you come close to me, you sinful person, you. And now God says, wham, through my beloved son, whom I am well pleased, come on. You see, every sacrifice that was made up to that point, every bull, every goat, every pigeon, Every calf, everything that had been offered up to to that point was just a picture of the one sacrifice that God would be satisfied with. A bull can't die for people. A person has to die for people. But you can't die for me. I can't die for you. And if Jesus was just a man, then Jesus was just dying. But if Jesus was God in the flesh... He can do anything he wants. And God Almighty in flesh said, I have come to seek and save that which is lost. Not that I don't know where they are, but they're not with me because I'm holy. And they're not. They're created in my image and I love them. And I want them with me. But I will not wink at their sin. Someone must die for their sin. Either they die for their sin or somebody else dies for their sin. And that somebody else, the only one that can die for the sins of the whole world is God. In the flesh. In the person of Jesus. Which is why it is so important for people to understand that Jesus is not just a man. That Jesus is God incarnate. And he deliberately went to the cross. He came for the purpose of going to the cross. In one passage in the book of John, he says, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this hour I came into the world. And then what did he say when he was ready to breathe his last? It is finished. Tetelestai is the Greek word. It means payment has been made in full in the marketplace. Or it means as far as a prisoner who has been uh, sentenced, it means that the sentence has been served. I could see it meaning both. The price has been paid. The sentence has been served. You and I deserve to die for our sins. Somebody already died for them. And the Bible says, whosoever will may come. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast them out. What a wonderful promise. God has not changed. He is still holy, holy, holy. He still hates sin. But the covenant has changed. God who said, you can't approach me until the one sacrifice that I'm satisfied with will be made. And until that that sacrifice has been made of my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, 
There's going to be a curtain. There's going to be a holy of holies, and you don't go there. But now that my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased has been sacrificed for your sins, curtain opened. Come on in. Believer in Jesus Christ, oh, that is something to just thank God for every day, over and over and over and over. But please don't forget this. He has not changed. And so, believer in Jesus Christ, you confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He promises that. But don't get presumptuous. Don't take him lightly. Well, I'll, you know, God understands the way that I am, and I'll just do this again and then ask for forgiveness. I've had people come to me before, you know. And, you know you're, not, you're not supposed to do that. Well, I know God will forgive me. So I'll just, you know, I'll just... In other words, I'll just keep on doing this and confessing it. You know, like dumping your garbage and get another load. You know? This God who has not changed also inspired Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, that said, don't take lightly the chastening of the Lord. For whom he loves, he also chastens and scourges every son that he receives. Scourging is not a swat on the hand with a ruler. Scourging is a whipping. The chastening of the Lord is a very serious thing. First John chapter 5, John is about to close it out. He's the last living apostle, you know. He's 90-something years old. He says, you know what? There's a sin unto death for a believer. And a person reaches that point in his life, don't pray for him, just give up. I don't know when that point is with your life or my life. But I do know as a believer in Jesus Christ, God will never leave me or forsake me. He promised that his Holy Spirit would be with me forever. He promised that I am his child and I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So I'm in the family and I'm in the family forever. But it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, if you call the Father who is without partially partiality, judging according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the stay of your life in fear. Oh, but that means reverence. Okay. Reverence, how do you define reverence? Well, you know, you show him respect. Okay, you show him respect and do what you want. Or you show him respect and obey him. In interpreting the word of God... You always take the obvious interpretation of a word unless it's impossible to take it that way. Okay? You know, so when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and said, the, the water that I give will be a well of water springing up to everlasting life, that couldn't have meant just physical water. So it had to mean something other than just physical water. But when you come to the word fear, don't jump automatically to reverence. Reverence indeed, but fear predominantly means fear. Wait a minute, am I supposed to be afraid of God? Don't ever be afraid of Him leaving you. Don't ever be afraid of Him forsaking you. Don't ever be afraid of Him not giving, you know, giving you everlasting life and giving you a wonderful place in heaven and on a new heaven and a new earth, you know, all of those are promises that he gives you. He will never leave you, but understand this, he won't leave you alone either. Because fear doesn't just mean a reverence and a respect. <coughs> it means my heavenly father is the God who created everything out of nothing and made Mount Sinai, Sinai Mount Sinai, made Mount Sinai shake. Didn't make Mount Sinai shake, made Mount Sinai shake. That's the God that we have to deal with. Hebrews 12, 29, our God, speaking to believers, is a consuming fire. Use my dad as an illustration. Loved, trusted my dad. Dad passed away December the 31st of 2019 at the age of 98. He would have been 99 last week. I would go squirrel hunting with Dad. Even when I was too little to carry a gun. My brother Joe and I would go squirrel hunting with Dad. And sometimes he would say, boys, 
uh, I saw one move around on the other side of the tree. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn your back on me and I want you to start walking. And when that squirrel sees you on the other side of the tree, it's going to scare him back around to my side and I'll shoot him. Do you understand that I turned my back on a man who had a 12 gauge and I was not the least bit afraid that he's going to shoot me in the back or anything like that. I, matter of fact, I liked hearing kaboom because I thought fried squirrel. Okay. But one thing that I did not do, never sassed him. And I never sassed mom. You understood you sass dad, you sass mom, you have something to be afraid of. You stick your face up to dad and you say, I'm not going to do this or you're just a this or you're just a that. There were going to be serious repercussions. Now, I didn't walk around thinking how scared I was of dad. I walked around thinking how much I loved him and how much I trusted him, how I loved to go fishing with him, loved to go to Midwest City bomber games and watch football games with dad. Watch, I'm sorry, Oklahoma State people, watch OU games with dad. You know, I can remember like yesterday, Eddie Hinton, boy, am I dating myself on that. But we were about to lose and Eddie Hinton caught a pass that he really shouldn't have caught. And he ran for a touchdown. And dad jumped up on top of the sofa. And he's jumping up and down going, go Eddie, go Eddie, go. Man, I'll never forget that. You know, I, I loved my dad. But I was afraid to defy him or sass him or disrespect him or my mama. And that's what we're talking about as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? The new covenant is a wonderful thing through Jesus Christ and you're not in God's courtroom anymore. You're in God's family. You are a child of God. But your father is fearful and awesome and holy. He's not to be taken lightly. Don't get presumptuous with God. But then the main thrust of this is, wow, this unapproachable God is now approachable through Jesus Christ. Now, this is a little bit of a side thing, and then I'll be done. How did Old Testament people get saved if Jesus hadn't been crucified yet? Jesus even called heaven the bosom of Abraham. Abraham was saved. Well, it says in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Well, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. Yeah, but Abraham believed God. So, sorry to sound like 21st century American business, but he was saved on credit. Jesus hadn't been crucified yet, but Jesus was going to be crucified for Abraham's sins, for David's sins, for Jacob's sins, for poor Isaiah's sins. Oh, holy God, you know. Jesus was going to be crucified for their sins. And whatever God had said to them in the Old Testament, they believed it. And they believed him. They were justified by faith, just like we are. They were justified by faith by the blood of Jesus who was going to be crucified for them. We are justified by faith in the blood of the Jesus who was crucified for us. Jesus died for the sins of Abraham, just like he died for the sins of Tom Crager, who is now in his very presence, and just like he did for your sins and mine. And so, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, man, don't put it off. I mean, think about that. He loves you so much that he was willing to go to the cross for you and pay the penalty that you deserve so that you could be with him forever and ever. Not just to save you, but to save you to be with him. Because he loves you. you. Don't put that off. Let's go ahead and take care of that. And then believers in Jesus Christ, if you've got some pet sins in your life, don't pet them. <laughs> Confess it. Forsake it. Pray for the grace to overcome it. Don't stop. Keep fighting it. Keep struggling with sin. Don't ever snuggle with sin. All done.